Good evening. Welcome to the first member meeting of 2020, the AIA Las Vegas January membership meeting. And this year, our focus is on the urgent issue of climate change and how architects are uniquely positioned to help solve that problem. In addition to providing a series of educational and inspiring lectures, workshops, and programs, AIA Las Vegas will continue with our community outreach and support of worthy causes in our community. And one of the most important and worthy causes is our annual Bald by Design program raising money for the St. Baldrick's Foundation to research and cure childhood cancer. Our team has raised an amazing amount of money over the last 10 years. And to tell you more about this year's event, I'm proud to introduce Phil Ralston, president of America Nevada Company and our chair for the Bald by Design team. Phil. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, for those of you who don't know, might not know what St. Baldrick's is, St. Baldrick's has been around. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this uh, year in 2020. And they raise money almost exclusively by these head shave programs. And they fund research and other initiatives related to pediatric cancer. They raise uh, over $30 million a year and fund grants accordingly. Um, we have had uh, events going here for, I believe, about 14 years. Our team's been in play for 10 to 11 of that. Some of us have been shaving all of that time or a year less than all of that time. And we each year, uh, we get a team together with the Bald by Design team uh, that was mentioned. And the AIA chapter here, I'm, I don't even know how many years ago, 10 or 11 years ago, became our kind of official sponsor. And uh, a lot of our team members are AIA members. And if I could, just folks that have shaved or are shaving this year, could you stand up? I, I just want you guys to see how many folks in here. Um, so the chapter has great representation uh, over the years. And so, yeah, thank you. And uh, Randy mentioned that we have... Uh, the, with the team being in place 10 to 11 years, every year it's a different bunch. There's become a core that have been in there multiple years, but we have raised uh, 820-ish thousand dollars over that team history, and we're getting to the point where we raise a little over 100 grand every year. And there's usually between 30 and 40 people, 10 to 15 are regulars, and the rest come and go. Some folks shave every other year, some folks shave once every 10 years. But we, we like to ask anyone who's interested, please come be a shavy with us. It's a fun way to raise money for a serious issue. And if you decide not to shave, you saw a lot of heads around the room, please support somebody. I'm, we want to hit a million dollars, and we need to raise 180000 to do that. We've never raised that much money. So I'm, I'm putting a call out. Either support big or come shave. The more team members we get, the more we raise. Um, also, another effort that our team is putting forward, separate from the head shave, is we, we're going to have a clay shooting competition. I don't know how many of you have participated in those, but they act like golf tournaments. And you set up teams of four. They have an, uh, not quite an 18 station field, but you basically go through it like a golf course and tee up the clays and shoot them down. And that's, we're going to try and raise some money doing that. Uh, that's on April 17th. I'm sure you'll get information through the AIA mailers as well as directly from us. Um, let's see. That's it. Uh, did I miss anything? Guys. Any, what? Oh, March 7th is the shave date. Our team shaves at McMullen's Irish Pub. We usually shave about 5 p.m. We have enough people on our team. We just take the hour. They shave seven heads every 15 minutes from about 11 a.m. till 2 a.m. Um, it's an amazing site. If you haven't seen it, stop by. We'll, we'll broadcast when our team is shaving. Even if you're not shaving, come by and see it. It's a heck of a thing to see. Um, thank you. What? There is, it's an Irish pub, for crying out loud. <laughs> you know about those. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, please, it, it's a great sight to see. Um, it's just it's standing room only, and you'll get a chill if you come, and hopefully you'll support us. So thank you very much. I appreciate the support, Alex. One, one more thing. Alex Raffi's on our team. All right, thanks everybody. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much. Okay, before we go any farther, I would like to um, do a special recognition and thank you to Advance, Advance EV and A and Associates for being our sponsor for this evening. Thank you, Ed. We appreciate that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I also want to thank all of you who participate in the Ball by Design program, and we will see you on March the 7th at Macmillan's Pub. Uh, can't wait to take those pictures of the bald heads and all the fun that we have. Uh, I am also honored to introduce the 2020 president of the AIA Las Vegas chapter, Lance Kirk, AIA. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> thank you for coming out tonight. I, I really want to uh, say thank you because this is the start of a wonderful year, start of 2020, start of an important topic, and it's great to see so many people in the room. Um, <clears throat> so thank you for being here, and, and thank you, Randy. So before we begin, I'd like to start with recognizing our 2020 sponsors and thank them for their support. So the visionary sponsors for 2020 <clears throat> are Bergman Walls and Associates, John A. Martin Associates of Nevada, Clyde Juba Wald Architecture Plus Interiors, and Knit. So thank you, visionary sponsors. And our platinum sponsors are Nevada Sales Agency, Harris Consulting Engineers, TJK Consulting Engineers, Nevada Lighting, and of course 501 Studios, uh, Levi, he's our official photographer. So thank you guys. And our gold sponsor, Aria Landscape Architecture, American Insurance and Investment Corp, Assurance Limited, Locksaw Engineering, Southwick Landscape Architects, and Terp Consulting. So thank you to them as well. <laughs> and lastly, our silver sponsors, Bank of Nevada, Core Construction, Helix Electric, JLP Inc., LGA Architecture, NV5, Pogemeyer Design Group, Silverlands Inc., and of course, SR Construction. So thank you. <laughs> so to start off, I want to talk a little bit about, um, before we go to our speaker here this evening, uh, why is AI Las Vegas focusing on climate change? So I just want to give you a, a bit of an overview of what's connecting all of this and why we're taking on, taking action to transform the practice of architecture. So many of you may know buildings generate nearly 40% of annual greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the global building stock will double um, in area by 2060 and expected to be 2.5 trillion square feet of new floor area by that time. That's a, mount, a massive amount of growth and building square footage, and all of that is gonna need to be addressed somehow with, with climate issues. And we will be building on what AI National's been doing with all their good work through their programs that they've been doing over the last few years, and I, I know Marsha's gonna speak a little bit about this, but the, the AI Blue Ribbon Panel on Codes and Standards, uh, the resolution for urgent and sustainable climate action, which passed this last year, very important milestone in AI history, I believe, and of course the work of the Sustainability Leadership Group, those are all key components that have been building up to this moment. And then, of course, in the state of Nevada, uh, Governor Sisolak's leadership, actually. Um, Nevada joined the U.S. Climate Alliance in March of 2019, and when the governor signed and pledged to uphold the Paris standards. So this is significant for Nevada. 
Um, of course, our renewable standards. Many of you know about this past legislative session with AB 385, 50% renewables by 2030. That's a, a, a milestone in of itself. And then also, which passed this last legislative session, SB 254, which is an act that um, the state is it, relating to greenhouse gases, requiring the state to um, issue an annual report on the greenhouse emissions that they're doing. Previous to last year being approved, it was every four years, and they weren't they weren't doing anything about it. So, right now, this is this is a good thing because now they're being required to um, demonstrate this annually. And right now, the last media I saw, they were they were about they anticipate being about four percent off um, for the 2025 goals. So we're close to target, but there's much work to be done. <clears throat> And then, of course, the work that County Commissioner uh, Justin Jones is doing. He's leading the effort in Clark County uh, with hiring a sustainability coordinator and, and adopting climate action plan. So it's happening at our local government and our state government. And with all this around climate change world, nationally, and of course locally, 2020 will be about AIA Las Vegas preparing its members to better understand how buildings contribute to climate change developing expertise to lead and demonstrate the skills and abilities to act on climate change. 2020, we will bring national speakers here. We'll bring workshops and educational opportunities. It's about training and educating so we're prepared to take on climate issues. Our objectives for this year are going to be build a generation of architects to become experts and leaders in climate change. Train design professionals on high performance buildings and skill sets so they have the best practices to be what are required for the next decade. Demonstrate skills and abilities to act in the future. Work with policymakers to set standards to reduce carbon emissions. And lead and support adoption of zero code in Las Vegas and the state. I think this can happen in the next year or two. I'd really like to see that happen. And increase the number of Nevada firms, this is important, who support and participate in the AI 2030 commitment. Right now, there's one. We have one firm who's an actual international firm, but we have one, and it, we, need to, we need to build that. We need to um, show that Nevada supports this as well. So I hope to build that and get other firms to, to buy into that. We'll, we'll have this more on the agenda in the future here. So designing and building resilient buildings in the near future um, is no longer optional. It's imperative and vital importance to climate, community, and our profession, in fact. So with this in mind, we are fortunate tonight to welcome Marsha Madam, FIA, Lead AP. She's a principal with Lady Ma uh, sorry, Letty Madam, Stacy Architects in San Francisco. For over 30 years, she has focused her career on community, cultural, and social responsibility responsible projects that promote sustainable design. Her work has included the creation of new buildings, rehabilitation of historic buildings, and adaptive reuse of existing structures. Her projects include Sweetwater Spectrum Community, North Beach Branch Library, Cavallo Point Lodge at Golden Gate, the Thoreau Center for Sustainability, and the College Center of the Arts in San Francisco at their campus. Marcia is also past chair of the Code AG Advisory Group, from what I recall. I believe you're past chair now. That was 2019. So please join me in welcoming Marcia Madam, FAIA. Thank you. It's great to be here, and I really um, want to thank everybody for the invitation and what a great thing you're doing here in Las Vegas. I jumped at the chance to come and support your, your year goal of uh, focusing on climate action and climate change. So I'm delighted to be here and let me get my clicker started. Just so you, you have, we can have a quiz now since uh, we, you just went over this, but when I did um, the research on what you were planning to do this year, I thought that these words build, train, demonstrate, work, lead, and increase. I think that's a, a fantastic structure for what we architects need to do immediately. And, and we have such an important role as leaders in this effort that needs to happen uh, with climate action. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the two, my, I'm from San Francisco, and uh, there's lots of differences between uh, the desert community here in Las Vegas in San Francisco, but there are also a lot of similarities. Uh, people think 
of San Francisco in this large Bay Area complex, but we're actually not that big of a city. We're 800,000, 880,000 right now. Las Vegas is 640 in your immediate uh, city area. And um, although our climate and our geographic conditions are very different, we actually share a lot of the same uh, issues. Um, we have affordability and equity issues. We have a housing crisis in both cities. Homelessness is a, a big, big issue here, as, as it is in my city in San Francisco. So all of these things are connected together with climate and, um, and how we address and make a community uh, together. So um, I'm, the way I wanted to structure my talk was to tell you a little bit about our firm and then really focus a lot about the work that we've been doing at the AIA National um, about climate action to help tee up what you're doing this year here in, in uh, Las Vegas and in Nevada. So um, my firm, we've been practicing together for over 30 years. Bill Letty, Richard Stacy, and I have been sitting together since 1983, uh, working together on uh, sustainable design and really trying to make a difference in our community. In 2001, we uh, restructured our firm, and we've been focusing exclusively on what we call mission-driven work. And um, we felt that we had one career and one opportunity to make a contribution in our community. So we've decided to focus only on, on those uh, types of mission-driven projects. And because we believe everyone deserves great design, not just uh, the few, not just the 1%, but everyone in our, in our society and, and culture will be better for it. So we work in three areas. We work in affordable, supportive housing. Again, homeless is, uh, is a huge issue in our city. Um, we also do education and uh, both K through 12 and university projects because we think it's a really great way to set example for the next generation um, about how to have a carbon, uh, low carbon and carbon neutral future. And, um, and the third area that we work in is uh, in community projects. Um, but who we serve are the underserved, the people who often don't have voices and, and don't get to experience um, great design. So we work with uh, the formerly homeless, adults with autism, the independent living and disability rights organizations, um, a whole host of uh, people within our community and our area um, and make, make their world better through design. So for us, that is mission-driven design. Um, we think it's a really important thing to do in our communities, and we've done it exclusively, but I think every practicing architect here um, can take, take that approach um, to work within your own communities. So we've been focusing on, on two issues, um, in particular, the uh, idea of designing for social equity, and then, of course, um, designing for a resilient future. Uh, we think that these are the two most important things that we as architects can do to, in our communities to make them better. We've been doing it for a really long time. You can see this timeline of things that we've been active in. Um, we have been involved in the Committee on the Environment for a long time. We were one of the first people to join the USGBC, early doctors there. And so we've been plugging away, and I, I want to stress that over the years that we've been practicing, we've always been about between a 15 to 25 person firm. So I think it's really important to understand that as a small firm that you can embrace this approach to design and teach yourself and um, educate your clients and, and, and transform the, the way that uh, both our practices worked over these years and also how our clients uh, think about architecture and sustainability. So for all of, for that, it's, um, it's all about design with purpose. Uh, that's what our practice is about. So on to climate change. Here we go. So um, the world seems to have reached a tipping point this year, which is very exciting. And um, as was mentioned, I was the chair of the Committee on the Environment um, this, this last year. And just about a year ago, I made a list of things I wanted to accomplish, and I'm happy to say that I was able to get them all done, including the resolution and the ratification of that and 
the AIA, I'm now on the task force for doing a climate action plan for the entire institute. Now, if somebody had told me January 15th last year that I'd be standing here saying that that all got done, I would tell them that they were probably crazy. But I think it's a testament to how motivated everyone is and how, um, how important the work uh, that we are doing now and how uh, open the Institute and our colleagues and um, people all across the country uh, they now recognize the importance of dealing with this immediately and urgently. So, this has been going on a long time. My professor, Ed Mazaria, many of you may know him through Architecture 2030. Uh, he's been an inspiration for me since I was in college. And he's been talking about this for a really long time. You know, is the architecture stupid, 2003. So, I think it's important to know that a lot of people have been really working hard and now is the time that the crescendo needs to build and we all need to be put into action. Um, the statistics we just heard, you know, we contribute over 40% to green, or just about 40% to the greenhouse gas emissions. We have a significant role in um, both polluting, as Ed's previous picture showed, but we also have a significant opportunity to to change the way the world, uh, our industry works, and to make a positive contribution in um, trying to find solutions for, for climate change. And we need to do it now. As it says, we only have um, 10 years, and I think that's optimistic, to change course. Um, I'm sure you guys have all seen this graph a thousand times. And today is an important day to think about this graph again because uh, the New York Times reported today that uh, the 2019 was the second hottest year on record. Uh, 2016 is the hottest. And uh, we don't, don't seem to be uh, making any progress. I talked to Ed Masria recently and he said that the, the curve, you can see where we, we need to be there, um, we're right in that little mess right there, and if we don't get that curve going down, we're not gonna be able to keep the temperature um, under control. And things have been progressing pretty well, but this year things have flattened out worldwide, so we really need to be aggressive and urgent in, in dealing with uh, climate action in our industry um, where we can have an impact, but certainly throughout, throughout the world. So, this was another statistic you, you mentioned. Uh, it's staggering to think uh, how much building is going to happen in the, in the, next, the next decades. Uh, with the move to urban areas happening all across the world, uh, the amount of building that is going to happen is staggering. These numbers are huge. We're gonna double the current worldwide building stock. That is an amazing statement. So we have an opportunity to do it right, or we have an opportunity to do it wrong and compound the, the problem that we're in. So I choose to think that let's grab the opportunity to do it right. Um, we also have a really important opportunity to think not only about the new buildings that are being built, but about the embodied carbon that's represented in our existing building stock. So um, really being conscious and aware of, of the resources around us and how we make our existing buildings more energy efficient, how we transform our existing buildings, the embodied carbon in those is really an important resource. So, not to depress you, this is Ed's slide, and I love this slide. So 30 years, we've got 30 years to, to correct, the, to correct our, or set our new course and correct the ship. So 30 years seems, doesn't seem very long, but when you look at what's happened um, between 1925 and 1955, that was 30 years. And we basically transformed the way we built. We went from um, you know, brick, brick bearing wall buildings, uh, tenements, you know, to uh, through the modern movement and skyscrapers and te technological advances in steel and concrete. Um, we really transformed the way we built and we transformed our built environment in those 30 years. And what did we do that with? We did that with T-squares and pencils and slide rules. We had, you know, we didn't even get a computer until 1984, way past that 30 years. So think what we could do now. 
Uh, we have so many more resources and technologies available to us. We have a culture of innovation. Um, and I think that there is great opportunity for architects to be leaders in finding climate solutions. So I'm sure you feel better now, right? Um, so I recently attended a carbon positive conference in Chicago this September, and I urge you all to think about going to a larger carbon summit um, that Architecture 2030 and Architect Magazine is sponsoring in Los Angeles, not too far from here, in March, and um, really addressing uh, how we can tackle the carbon problem, both on from operational carbon and also uh, carbon embedded and embodied in our materials. And, you know, this is a lot of information, but we really need to push towards carbon neutral and hopefully by 2040 beating the 2050, which is a lot of uh, municipalities and countries are targeting 2050 for carbon neutral, but um, we really need to try to um, push that to 2040. Uh-oh, I lost some carbon people, sorry. Really, you can do it. Don't give up. Um, okay, so I just want to mention that um, as architects, if we think about the most, uh, the highest level of carbon is in concrete and steel. And if we can just tackle those two materials in the way we build, we would have a really major impact on the carbon footprint of our, of our industry. So I urge you all to talk to your structural engineers and think about how to get fly ash and slag and change the concrete um, you know, pr production for your buildings. Think about you know, one of the great advantages of um, mass timber buildings is that structure is lighter, so then, therefore your foundations aren't as heavy and full. So just think about that in your practice. How can we tackle those two materials, carbon and steel, and we would have a great impact? So this is our pitch. We need to be working in uh, embrace the natural world, and we really need to be working together to create a regenerative and a just future, future for everyone. And that really is an important role of architecture in our society. So as mentioned, um, I have been really involved in the uh, AIA Committee on the Environment. And does, does Las Vegas have a chapter here? OK, great. So this network of co-chapters around the country have really been doing amazing work over the years. And the National Advisory Group, um, which has representatives from all over the country, all over the country um, we've really been working over the last 30 years um, pushing this agenda. Uh, many of you know Bob Berkevile from um, BNIM. He, um, 30 years ago, wanted the AIA to address in, in environmental issues, and uh, they weren't doing it. And so he stormed the floor at a convention 30 years ago and got them to create the Committee on the Environment. So we're celebrating our 30th year this year. I invite you all to the conference in Los Angeles where we're going to have a really big party. Uh, to celebrate all the achievements. Um, but I was really inspired by Bob's story. Um, Bob and Ed Masry actually were the, the two people who did that. And uh, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna storm the floor again. Uh, and so we, a group of us, we called ourselves the, the old revolutionaries. Um, we decided to, to make this resolution um, for, um, oops, I'm sorry, I have a little bit more about COAT. I wanted to make sure you guys knew about this document. Um, it's available on the AIA website on the COAT webpage, and it gives you a lot of great tips about how uh, firms have been um, transformed their practice into high performance firms. So there's a lot of great information in there. One of the things that COAT has done over the years. Um, another really important thing that happened in 2018 was the passage of a change in the code of ethics. And it's now a part of our professional code of ethics that we have to inform our clients about the importance and the impact of the environment and building materials and water. So that, it's not, a, it's not an option. This is a part of our code of ethics. And I, th I don't think members know that that happened in 2018. But I urge you to read the detail of this. And that this is our professional obligation is to talk about environmental stewardship with our clients. It's part of, what, of who we are and what we do. So back to the storming the floor. 
So um, we felt that it was really important. Um, Carl Elefante, who is the past president and also a member of the Committee on the Environment, we really wanted to push the issue that it was time for urgent uh, climate action by the AIA. And that, uh, gratefully, was in coinciding with um, what the AIA has called the big move. Has anybody heard about the big move? A very funny name, um, particularly when they love acronyms back there. Um, so anyway, there's been this alignment and this, uh, this force towards climate action this year, which has been remarkable. So we did take our resolution to the floor, which has three simple points. Um, declare an, urban, uh, an urgent climate imperative, transform day-to-day -day practice of all architects, and utilize external messaging and really work on leveraging with our peers and really doing strong advocacy work. Simple, and it was overwhelmingly passed. It was an incredible moment on the floor uh, to see that happen. So the membership is behind this. And in September, the AIA board uh, ratified this as, um, as part of what the AIA is going to do now. And so it's really about um, transforming design culture. And I think it's um, really important to um, remember that Design excellence is everything. It's great design, but it also has to be up about performance. It also has to be about um, taking care of ourselves and our communities. So we really need to think about transforming the way we practice and how we think about our role as architects. So in the, the AIA, they did a sustainability scan a number of years ago, and this is a diagram that's shown quite a bit. And what, what the AIA is trying to do is push and propel the bell is the term they use, and try to push architects all across the country in their knowledge and their ability to uh, create more and more sustainable uh, projects. So that's one of the big efforts that's going to be underway in the coming year. So a little bit about um, our practice. You know, we think that there's a lot of talk at the AIA about integrated uh, an integrated practice, there's lots of information about that, but we think it really needs to be both integrated values and an integrated practice, and that's that's a way to transform that. And we, we structured our office as a teaching practice. We think that that's a really important role for architects to continue that, um, that effort and mentoring process uh, for the younger generation as well as our peers so that we can continue to build our knowledge, build our skills, and, uh, and that certainly applies to high performance and energy efficiency and sustainable design. So um, we believe in uh, transparency of um, purpose, practice, and action. And um, that's been very successful in our practice to motivate um, everybody at all levels in doing their best work and pushing all of us together forward, propelling that bell in the work that we do. And we, uh, again, are, yeah, are a relatively small firm. We're the biggest we've ever been at a little over 30. But we do all this stuff. We try to do this in-house. So we embed daylight studies and energy, you know, pre preliminary energy modeling uh, in the very early design phases um, so that it's all integrated into the design right at the beginning. So design excellence in the era of climate change, that is really what we need to do. We need to really think of this in a holistic and an integrated way, that performance and design and beauty can't be separated. They all have to be done together to be successful. So one of the things that we've done this year at the AIA is <clears throat> taken what um, the Committee on the Environment had as the 10 measures of design, um, and we've transform those into the framework for design excellence. And um, this framework is something that we are launching across the country to help practitioners think about design in this integrated and holistic way. And um, it's 10 measures. It's a framework that can be shared and is a resource that you can use with your clients and your communities. And um, it's really this comprehensive guide with a toolkit, which is like an uh, owner's manual, if you will, of how to do this in your practice. 
So the 10 measures, um, how many of you know about the 10 measures? Okay, I thought I maybe, okay, we got one, good. Okay, I thought maybe I would, this is all old news to you, but it, I guess it's not. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through this a little bit. So um, the Committee on the Environment came up with this way of thinking about design very holistically. So measure one is about integration, and that's the big story. So you can see that it comp it, it's very comprehensive from ecology and water to wellness and energy, of course, but also design for change because making an adaptable building, one that's going to be loved and used and transformed over time is just smart to do. And then um, the last one is design for discovery. One of the things that we as architects don't often do um, is go back and see how our buildings perform. So post-occupancy evaluation is another big push that the AIA and the Committee on the Environment are work, is working on to see how our buildings are used, how, is, you know, are our energy models that we do, are the buildings really performing that way? Maybe we can help our clients find out that their BMS system is set to Eastern time instead of Western time, which is what happened to me on one of my buildings, um, and help them tweak their system so that they are performing as they're designed. So anyway, these 10 measures are all integrated. Uh, they all relate to, get e to each other, and um, that's what we think is the framework for design excellence. So quickly, I'm going to fly through these fast so that we have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, but I'll just give you a brief overview of the, of the 10 measures. So as I mentioned, um, number one is the big, the big idea. This is the one that is all about integration and a holistic approach to design. And um, it's, it is the central design concept and the driver for the design. Number two, actually, in the process of this being adopted by the National AIA from the Committee on the Environment, this is now going to be uh, designed for equitable communities. Because we think the issue of equity is um, really important in, in all the areas of our country. And so how do we make buildings, how can our buildings contribute to uh, an equitable community? And of course, transit is a part of that and building on in a dense urban, you know, if you're in an urban environment and, um, you know, building upon the transportation system and infill sites, et cetera. Design for ecology, uh, this one is, you know, pretty straightforward, but just making sure that you're connecting to the place that you are building and being responsible in the stewardship of the site. And um, things like bird-friendly skies, it's a big deal in my city. Um, and I'm not sure if it is in Las Vegas. There are a lot of glass buildings here. Um, I don't know what your bird kill number is, but I bet it's pretty high. Um, but you know, just looking really at your local ecology and taking an, uh, a, a deep, deeper dive look into how your building can help help restore that environment. Design for water, a big issue here in Las Vegas, and certainly a big issue in California. And um, you know, we in California we have a lot of mandated requirements for uh, water efficiency, but stormwater management is a huge issue all across the country. Flooding is a major issue. I think it's the highest insurance risk right now is flooding across the country. So water is an, a really important design feature. And design for economy. This is really important. How can we make our moves uh, count the most? How can we do right sizing of buildings? You know, do you really need a 15,000 square foot car, four car garage house? I don't know, it's a question to ask. Um, and then of course operational efficiency is also a really important part of economy. Uh, design for energy, this one is the one we probably know the most about. Certainly California with our Title 24 energy code since the 1970s, this is something that we've all been really focused on. We just went through a new code cycle in California, so it's a 50% increase in efficiency that we're going to have in the coming years. But um, just making sure that you're thinking not only about the technical side, but also the passive strategies. You know, the site planning, and that is the most important energy uh, design move you can make oftentimes. So just thinking about energy in a very holistic way. Um, design for wellness. This is a very important one, and for we have found that health and wellness is the best avenue to convincing people about sustainable design. It's non-political. It just makes sense. 
Nobody wants to be sick. No one's going to build a building that's not going to make their clients feel better. So I think health and wellness is a really important part of what we as architects can do to educate and communicate to our clients. Design for resources, this one again, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, optimizing materials, um, you know, using materials in multiple ways so that maybe the concrete you have to use for your structure can also be used as a finish. Um, just thinking about the embodied carbon in the materials that you use, as I mentioned before, is a very, very important um, component of this. And carbon you're going to find in your practice um, is going to be taking a, a much stronger position. I know that there are a lot of tools that are coming out right now that are plugins to Revit for carbon calculators so that you can understand immediately how much carbon your materials are using and adjust so that you can get your uh, carbon number down. So the resources are really important. And as I mentioned, design for change is a very, very important one. We, we need to have buildings, this long life, loose fit. I love that term because we don't know how our communities are gonna evolve and change and we want our buildings to be used and have a useful life for a very long time and be flexible and adaptable, not only to new uses, but also new technologies. Um, and design dis for discovery, as I mentioned, about uh, understanding how our buildings work, doing post-occupancy, and then sharing those lessons that we learn, um, not only with our clients and our peers, but beyond. So, uh, here is how you can find this toolkit. So, um, the, the framework for design excellence, which has just been renamed in the last two months, um, you can go to the AIA web, website and find this information. And the way it's laid out is each one of the measures um, has a tile. And um, there's a information, which I'll go into later, but that describes each of the measures and resources. And there's also a companion super spreadsheet um, which Coat has uh, created in the last uh, two years. And I think Tate Walker is coming in January, uh, one of my former Coat AG members, who's just been amazing at putting this material together. So he'll probably give you a deep dive on how this works, but this is meant to be a very simple, it's an Excel spreadsheet, it's got the calculations in there, and you can just quickly, during your design process, you know, just test things out and see how you're doing. So hopefully he'll give you a deeper dive on that. So the framework is the, the 10 design principles. The toolkit is like the owner, owner's manual on how to. It's the how to do it. And then the super spreadsheet is like the, the, the uh, metric maker, the, the data driver. So this is the series of tiles that you'll see on the website. So if you, like for example, click on community, um, you'll have these choices. You can look at best practices and you'll have all these resources available to you. They're all curated. This is crowd crowdsourced from experts all around the country. So one of the most annoying thing is you have a question, you write Google and you, you have no idea if the answer Google gives you is the best one. So this resource is an incredible thing for architects. This is vetted, it's done by experts all across the country. You can rely on this information. So if you could only do one thing on a project, you know, this high impact, this will tell you the one thing to do. It's really challenging to do this work, we know that. You're not gonna do everything on every project, but maybe you could pick one thing and really talk to your client about why it's important. So this gives you a clue of like, on water, for example, what would be the one thing on water that would have the highest impact? And then this amazing list of resources, and then finally, there are case study projects that you can uh, go to. And another piece that the Committee on the Environment made is a design data map that's also a companion to this, where there's a map of the country and you can see uh, 25 years of Coat Top 10 award winner, award winning projects. Um, and you can click on it, and you can get all the, all the information about the project, the metrics, everything. So it's an incredible resource. So, 2030, 2030 commitment. Everybody in this room needs to sign up. For you really gotta do it. So there's only one, by next year, there should be, how many members do you have? Uh, <laughs> okay, 200. Um, 
You don't have to do anything to sign up. You don't, you know, you don't go to prison if you don't report. You know, no one's going to come and get you. But it's an important step. So just to sign up that you're going to, you know, educate yourself. You're going to see where your portfolio, how does your portfolio work? You know, what could we do in our practice? You, you, it's a really great tool within your own practice to say, well, that project, if we had done this, you know, we might have been able to get closer to the to what the, the 20, 2030 metric was. So I urge you all to sign up. Um, <clears throat> so we're not doing it fast enough. Uh, we're not meeting those, those metrics. It's really hard. Um, but, you know, we in our office, um, here's our, our portfolio of work, full disclosure here. So as I mentioned, we do affordable housing, supportive housing for the formerly homeless, um, K through 12 schools. These are not high-end clients. These are all on super duper tight budgets. Um, clients that, you know, this is not their primary goal, but we have clients that have really supported us in this work and it makes for healthy, efficient, cheaper buildings to operate for them. So we're working on it. So we're getting there, we're moving up. You see we have some that are net zero up at the top. Those are our, the happy stories. But full disclosure, we've got some, you know, it's, it's really hard with multi-story, um, multi-unit buildings um, to hit these targets. And we're really working hard in our firm to find strategies to get us closer to hitting the target. So awards alignment, um, this is the last uh, bit about the AIA. I just want to urge you all to think about your awards program and honor what we value. So um, make sure that you uh, include the sustainability metrics in your awards program. Do you do that now? There's a push nationally to have what we're calling the Common App. So this, this is in beta test right now. The Education uh, National Honor Awards, Housing National Honor Awards are using this. California is using this. Washington and I think Texas, as a beta test. So hopefully it'll be rolled out in the next two years. And it's just a way to gather information consistently so we can use that data. Right now, all this data that we all fill out on all those forms just disperses and nothing happens with it. Data is gold. So we can pool our data and learn from it and share it and learn from our successes. So the idea we had was to take the metrics that were based upon the 10 measures and then we can plot them out in the spider graph. And so this is a quick snapshot that will show you how a project is performing. So this one you can see is really doing a great job on ecology, but you know, maybe not so good on change. But you know, it, it will tell the jury that you know, these are things that, that there's some interesting stories in this, in this project that we want to learn about. And it's a really good way to test, again, how holistic the, the uh, project is. So I just want to put a plug in for the Code Top 10 student competition. This is also based on the 10 measures. It happens annually. It's announced with the professional Code, Code Top 10 winners. Um, it's a great way to teach a design studio. You can take one measure a week or however you want to structure it, but you can teach your students, again, about a comprehensive, integrated, and holistic approach to design excellence. Um, so I urge you all to check this out. Here's our students at uh, UC Berkeley in our uh, studio last term working on their projects. They just submitted them this week to the national competition. And the diversity of projects that we have received has been amazing from all across the country. All kinds of schools everywhere are participating. Zero code is really important. This has been a banner year for the zero code. In November, um, the uh, ICC just passed uh, the um, making this uh, an amendment to the 2021 cycle. Um, this will allow jurisdictions to take the zero code and adopt it um, locally if they have the opportunity to do that. Um, the zero code is sitting on Gavin Newsom's desk in California. Hopefully we're gonna get him to push that through. So it's really important that we make this law, that we, this is the best way to get things done, is through legislation and changing the code. So I urge you all to work on that here in, in uh, Las Vegas. So.
So finally, leadership and advocacy and being citizen architects, it's, I think is a really important role of architects in our community to be seen as leaders and to really uh, have an impact beyond the property line of our buildings. It's a really important thing that you can do and something that the AIA nationally has been supporting all across the country, this idea of the citizen architect. So with that, I am going to give you the fastest whirlwind tour of five projects um, that embodies uh, the work that our office has been doing over the last couple of years. I think four out of the five of these are co-top 10 winners. And uh, in the area of uh, the three types of work that we've been doing. And these are, I use these just as case studies for you to think about how you can embed sustainable strategies into your practice. So this is a uh, Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation at UC Berkeley. It's a very small little jewel of a project for the engineering department. Everybody on campus comes here to invent and uh, it's across an interdisciplinary maker space for the entire UC campus. So you can see the little building in the bottom of the slide. And it was built on top of an outdoor volleyball court. So that gives you the scale of the project. It's, um, but we wanted it to reflect um, the innovation that it was occurring there. It's a very high performing building. Uh, it was modeled to be 90% better efficiency than a baseline building. We did do our post-occupancy survey. We had our engineering students help us do the measurements and it's actually performing at 94% better. So it's performing better than we modeled it, which is great. Anyway, very simple strategies, daylighting, natural ventilation, a very large PV array on the roof, and um, really just an incredible space that students are loving. The next project is about um, embodied carbon and thinking about the historic resources in our community and how we can transform them. This is at Fort Mason on the Bay in San Francisco. This is an army uh, warehouse building uh, built in 1905 and we transformed it into an interdisciplinary art school for the San Francisco Art Institute. And you'll see my proudest moment is negotiating with the National Park Service and overruling Washington to get 450 feet of photovoltaic solar panels on a national landmark building. So that was one of my fine moments. So this building produces more energy, electricity, um, than it uses, and it um, actually provides additional electricity to the campus. So it's a great story wonderful army history. It served um, throughout f five wars. It um, provided warehouse supplies for uh, the entire Pacific theater during World War II. And so my challenge was to convince the National Park Service that what was filled with boxes and warehouses, it looks like um, that scene from Indiana Jones at the end, but um, that we really weren't doing anything to this landmark building. We were just transforming um, supplies for the Army into art. And so we created this building by uh, carefully inserting uh, new mezzanines that still enabled that power of that historic structure to be maintained and created a very dynamic uh, and high-performing space uh, for this art um, institute. I won't go into the details, but it's over the water, interesting thermal problems. We created a radiant slab over the whole building uh, uh, for the heating, and it's performing beautifully and um, really, a, again, a, a great energy performer. But mostly it's a, an incredible place to be and preserves the history. Um, another project is in Berkeley. Um, a Center for Independent Living and Disability Rights Movement. This was on, built on an air rights project on a parking lot. Uh, for, on the, for those of you familiar with the Bay Area, on a BART, the BART Bay Area Rapid Transit System. So this is at the Ashby BART station. And uh, th this is a center for nine different organizations that were scattered all over. And uh, it's named after Ed Roberts, who was uh, based in Berkeley and was a UC Berkeley student. And he was the person who initiated the uh, ADA and independent living movement. So this is really in his honor. And um, again, we created this nonprofit center on top of a BART station and 
really highlighted uh, universal design strategies and really took that to a whole new level. And that's one thing that we do in our practice. We do a lot of uh, research um, specific to projects, uh, do a lot of first time projects with nonprofit clients. And it's a um, very interesting, I won't go into all the detail, but again, it's been transformative for those groups. Uh, Net Zero Energy, PGE, our utility company pilot project for a, a new community in Sonoma for adults with autism, another really uh, important challenge in our society. So this was a new development um, which marries sustainable design, universal design, and sustainable design in creating a new, a new welcoming community um, right in downtown Sonoma. And very simple buildings. Um, Again, really interesting design problem to design on for individuals on the autism spectrum with hypo and hypersensitivities. A really interesting design uh, challenge. But mostly it's about making great spaces for these people and then creating a permanent home for them to thrive and live independent lives with the support that they need. And again, it's a net zero energy project. And finally, the last project, is another COTOF 10 winner right at the gateway to San Francisco. This is a housing for the formerly homeless in the new Trans Bay District. It's 120 uh, single occupancy studio apartments with uh, full on-site support services, as well as um, just an integrated retail area in this new neighborhood in San Francisco with a fancy chocolate shop and a Vietnamese sandwich shop. And you can see the photovoltaic and solar hot water panels on the top of the building. So the million dollar condos look down on uh, renewable energy and uh, healing our society. Uh, so the project is uh, again very warm and welcoming with uh, integrated courtyard spaces, um, green roofs, uh, rain screen, high performance envelope. And, you know, it's really just um, a lot of sustainable design strategies. This is a Green Points project equivalent to Platinum. But really, it's just a, a great building integrated into the city, and you would uh, nobody would ever know that there are 120 people being having their lives rebuilt um, very successfully um, in this project. So with that, back to the call to action. It's up to you. Be leaders. You've got a whole year ahead to learn. And um, thank you very much. So we've got a few, a few minutes for questions. I wanted to make sure we left some time. So thank you. <laughs> you know, the Royal Institute of Architect Reba is doing all kinds of stuff. That, you know, there are lots of uh, institutions around the world that are probably ahead of us, but um, it's been very encouraging. Um, the president last year, Bill Bates, went to London and met with Reba. And um, there have been some other individuals on COAT that have met with international groups. And um, they really love the framework, um, that they, do, they don't have anything like that. So we're doing a sharing about that. And um, so that is one thing on our agenda is to have an exchange. And one of the, now that I'm not the chair, um, my agenda this year, which I'm formulating what I want to get done this year, um, one of the things is um, reaching out to an organization of international architects that are trying to do just that, trying to share best practices, trying to share how we can amplify the work that we're doing. So we're not working in silos and trying to reinvent. So um, we've had great interest from Australia and uh, England um, about the uh, doing an adoption of something similar to the, the framework and the toolkit. So I think it's super important to share. Hi. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the membership that d d does not believe that climate change is the issue. Yeah. Um, I have made a presentation at the, uh, in Reno and Vegas last year on the Introduction to Living Building Challenge, and uh, 
some of the feedback that I heard is when you start talking about climate change, you've lost me. And right. what you're saying is criminal, quote. Right. Um, so I, you know, some, you know, obviously I just kind of, I, I try to talk to them, but their minds are made up about certain, that, that this is a political issue. Right. How have you dealt, dealt with people? Um, well, like, how do we kind of start to bring them into this? I, I think, you know, some people you're never going to change, but... I, we have used health and wellness as our gateway to conversation um, because it's, it, it, who can argue with that? And um, that and money, so health and money. So get your business case down. That's what we've done. You know, our clients are not uh, super wealthy by any stretch. And so we have to be really diligent about crunching the numbers, making the case for operational benefits long term, doing the, um, you know, the analysis that shows their payback. So money and health, we found to be excellent. Because you're not, you know, if you come at them saying they're wrong, you're just, that's just a, not a conversation, that's just a fight. So I, I don't like to do that. This framework that you introduced is really intriguing to me. Good. But how do you get a firm while they're functioning Designing, they're doing projects. How do you, how do you um, change the firm? How did you did you go about doing that at yours? Or? Yes, we did. I mean, we started. You know, we had a little bit of a longer run. I totally understand that, but I think that's the beauty of the framework. And that that one point, like if you could only do one thing, what could I do? And maybe that's the way you think about it. Um, so the way that we've embedded it into our practice, and again, you know, we're not a huge group. We don't have a director of sustainability. We try to empower everybody on every team. We we set up a sustain or a you know a sustainability champion on each project. So, so someone to just make sure that we're keeping true to the goals that we set at the beginning. So we use the the framework as. Um, at the very beginning of concept design, we have this form, and we set targets for what we want in each of the categories. Like, And they can be adjusted to what your client's needs are and what you think you're able to achieve. But just even having that conversation with your team members, with your engineers, you know, with your landscape architect about, well, what are we going to do about stormwater here? That's a game changer. So I would just try to get in at the level at which you can successfully communicate to your staff and your clients and your consultants. Um, and if it's just doing one thing and having a conversation about stormwater or, well, do we really need to use vinyl on this? You know, can we, can we just look at the flooring, other flooring products that are available? Just having that conversation, then suddenly that conversation happens in your office, and then you can take it to the next step. So I really recommend coming up with a simple matrix of just at the beginning of every project. Okay, let's. What's our big idea? You know, what are we going to do? What's our goal for our energy? What's our goal for trying to reduce carbon on this project? Just take it step at a time. Hi, Marcia. Uh, by the way, it was very nice meeting you earlier, and I just had one thing that I wanted to ask you because uh, I and my team at Fortress Innovations, we research a lot of the sustainable projects that have been done around the country, and we look at them and try to figure out what made them sustainable. And what we find is they're built, usually they're built with wood. They use solar or, or uh, wind to generate uh, the energy. And a lot of them seem to grow vegetables, and somehow that's sustainable. And to me, <laughs> <laughs> in all due respect, I applaud what they're trying to do. But to me, the use of wood today is like chewing tobacco and saying, I'm not a smoker. It's, it's, it's kind of defeating the purpose of sustainability. And, and you had mentioned something about steel, how it's, it's perceived to be uh, heavier than wood, and that's not what we found, our engineers have found. And I'm wondering why the use of cold form, light gauge cold form steel, and I emphasize light, is not more utilized in projects because for us to build a 2,000 square foot home, it, caught, it takes 50 trees to build that home, and we do that with three to four recycled cars. And so I'm wondering why in the sustainable world 
two things is steel not more utilized because it is in fact less uh, than wood on a per square foot basis, especially with the world demand of wood. And secondly, why isn't seamless insulation pushed more instead of this fiberglass or these other natural products that seem to degrade over time, which as the structure, whether it's the fact that it's built with wood and these natural materials degrades over time, why isn't there a focus on, frankly, building homes on Earth like we would on Mars, make them light, <laughs> make them, and it's possible. We have the technologies. They're just yeah. not being promoted because yeah, of perception I think, I think it's really so. the key to that is education. I think that um, getting the word out, and one of the things that we're really trying to do, um, we, the, what National AIA, in this effort of really pushing forward with urgent climate action, is to communicate and educate about the choices that we have, the options that we have, and the and really pushing for the innovation that we know we need to have happen. So I think it's really important for all of us as practicing architects, you know, to push on each project as we can, ask those questions like, well, why are we doing it this way or this? You know, just don't go to your structural engineer and say, do, do what you do all the time. Let's try to be in communication um, with everybody we work with to help push the needle forward. So I think it has to do a lot with education. The whole thing about wood and steel, I don't have enough time to go into that. There are pros and cons on both. Um, let's just say there's, it's a complex issue. But we have to think about how, where we get the raw material, what it takes to make the raw material, where it's transported from. You know, it's a big, it's a big issue, big, big question. Hello, my name's Brian. I'm a plumbing contractor. I appreciate the AAIA inviting me tonight. I was really interested in uh, what you had to say. Um, I'm all for sustainability, don't get me wrong. Um, but also, magnetic, magnetic fields are going to change. The sun is going to swallow the earth. And climate is going to change. And our networks are going to be hacked. So one question <laughs> I had. I mean, so Wait, I think some of those things have happened. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> So, um, as a plumber, w w one crisis, I guess, we could say, because one thing I think when we say climate crisis, we're, we're begging the question. Yes, climate is going to change, but what are we going to do when it does? Uh, as a plumber, one of the things that we dealt with was the 1.6 gallon toilet, if right. we all remember that fiasco. And I, I love our president, but when he's talking now about the light bulbs and the toilets and everything, I, I, I cringe a little bit because as an industry, we've gone beyond the 1.6 toilets. When we created 1.6 toilets, it was a disaster. 1.28 toilets, uh, one gallon flush urinals, to me, they work fantastically. So I guess my question is, why are we pushing the government to regulate all this, whereas an industry, construction, design, why aren't we pushing more codes that are being adopted rather right. than ha having the, the, the government say, no, you have to do this? Ha having politicians that really don't know what we do right. <laughs> saying, this is what we need it's to do. It's all about the codes. I totally agree with you. I, uh, getting the zero code, like in California, we've seen the, the incredible impact that Title 24 had on our state and thereby rippling out all across about energy efficiency. You know, the codes are really where it's at, I think, and it sounds like you do too, right? But, yeah, right, so the great thing about this most recent victory at the ICC was that it was a collective, integrated assault, really, to get that thing passed, and it was industry, it was professionals. Um, it was all kinds of people that really put a big push to get that adopted this in November. And to me, that's a success because all of those groups did come together and work together to do what we kn knew we needed to do. And once it becomes code, then it, it's really it's not a discussion. It's we got to do it. So, and let's face it, not every building in America is built by an architect. So uh, the building codes are really, really important. So I agree with you, and we don't want anybody in the EPA right now to be making decisions. <laughs> Just a thought. Okay, anyone else? More questions? 
One more there. Ah, okay. Hi, so I have a question really about um, kind of re... So I mainly do interiors. And so my question is, I'm looking for more resources that I can use to bring sustainability to design. I mean, kind of beyond replacing the light fixtures with LEDs. Right. Because that's like the big one, right? That's just pretty much what we do. Um, <laughs> But, but it's cost-effective. That's why the market's changed, because it's cost-effective and it's great. Well, well, it's pushed the whole LED mm -hmm. industry to right. develop a better LED that right. doesn't go off. Anyway, but um, looking for more resources or strategies that you can do as sort of the second generation in a building or the third or the fourth right. to reuse it, kind of you know, take that embodied carbon, as, you, as mm -hmm. it were, and make the most of it. I right. mean, you know, I mean, day to day, it's like I hear about it. I'm like, well, you know, pretty much we're replacing lights. Yep, that's what this is going to happen. No, there's much more you can do. And I'd like to find out more about that. So I, I would suggest you go look at the toolkit and under the resources page and the materials section, um, there's a lot of resources in there. And there's an effort going on um, with a materials research group at the AIA, um, again, trying to develop more information that we can share. So, um, Definitely stay tuned, but there's all kinds of, of information about, well, as, as I mentioned, flooring options and ceiling tile options. There, there's good ones and there's bad ones. Uh, just the way that you repurpose buildings, really thinking about that creatively and not just coming in and scooping it all out to the landfill, but maybe look at in a new, new way about how the resources that you inherit in an interiors project. Paints, my goodness, what, what changes we've seen in that industry in the last 10, 15 years, it's amazing. So paints and carpets and all, I mean, every, there's so much material that goes into every project you do and there's choices to be made. Um, I'm doing the Northern California Planned Parenthood headquarters right now in San Francisco. Had a really interesting discussion about health with that client and really strapped for cash. You know, it's really, um, they have a very limited budget. But I was able to come with them with research that Kaiser, a big healthcare provider, has done. And they have an amazing array of information that's available about all the flooring materials and healthcare settings, all the, the wall coverings, like everything. So if you get somebody like Kaiser that has buying power and is starting to educate all the people that they work with and their vendors, then we're going to have change. So there's, there's a lot that you can do. Yeah, I guess I, because I know about the the finishes. I mean, I, to pull all that information in, I get you know. I guess what I really wanted to ask was about uh, more about the HVAC systems because it seems like that's a bigger deal on these existing buildings, on the on the the skins and the because they're by by and large. I mean, a lot of the buildings I work at work in, they're you know 30, 40 years old. They're ready right. now for this renovation. Right. You know, it's time to do it and. I don't have a whole lot of resources or knowledge on that to, to guide them and push them through. And it'd be great to have that. Would you just go to the framework? Um, yeah, I would do that. But I would, I would find a, a like-minded mechanical engineer that you work with well and do some research. Because there are, you know, those systems do have to get upgraded. And again, back to that slide about doubling the building stock around the world. Again, we have a choice to do it right. Or we have a choice to either do it as we've always done it, or maybe make it worse. So, you know, picking the right, um, at the moment when someone's putting an investment into a building, finding a system building. that's gonna save them money long term and make it better operational and maybe more healthy with better filters and HEPA filters and things, you know, that's a way you can get at that conversation. Thank you very much. Do you, is there anything on the horizon for concrete? It seems like, you know, we're doubling the, amount of square footage right. of buildings, and most of the buildings are all concrete. What are we going to do with that? It, well, there, there's actually pre pretty interesting developments going on. We're a part of a study on a, build, a building project that we're doing that the city of Berkeley is helping support using um, super high efficiency concrete with a huge amount of um, fly ash and slag in it, trying to test how far we can push those different concrete mixes. So that's one thing. Um, something that they're working on in Berkeley, I believe, um, 
is uh, concrete that is a carbon sequestration um, product, which is pretty exciting. So I think we're going to see a lot of developments in that in that arena. And that, that's what I think is really exciting about this opportunity. It's a great time to be an architect because, you know, we are the people who connect the dots. We're the people who have this integrated, holistic view of the built environment. And so we can ask those questions of our structural engineer, like, hey, have you, what, what do you know about this? Let's, let's try to push this. Let's have a conversation. So I think that we are in a really great position to really have impact. And we just need to embrace this challenge and go for it. Anyone else? All right. Okay, you better go do it. And everybody <laughs> sign up for the 2030 <laughs> commitment. <laughs>So real quick before you guys leave, a couple more things here real fast, but thank you, Marsha, for your insight, your expertise, your knowledge. It was wonderful and for helping us kick off 2020, so thank you. Um, so once again, thank you to our sponsors, um, but I did want to mention for our February uh, meeting, Marsha had mentioned that uh, Tate will be here, so we'll continue to explore um, the climate change issues, and Tate Walker, who is the Director of Sustainability for OPN Architects, will be here. He leads projects and initiatives across the firm's four offices. Uh, his expertise and role in the architectural design process, but also includes program and project management and development of technical guidelines for uh, his projects. So, um, so to learn more about... Um, so he will be here on February 12th, and he will dive a little bit more deep deeply into the super spreadsheet, I believe. He was one of the co-authors, as Marcia mentioned. So, so I would really, I think, thank you for tying this to all the resources, because I think that's the key. AIA, the code website, has great resources there, and that the super spreadsheet in particular gets into the details and, and actually compares what you should be, quant what you should be uh, um, comparing your project to. So it's a very great, great tool. So Tate will get into that next month on the 12th here at the WOW Theater. So thank you, everybody. Drive safely and have a wonderful evening.